Didn't so know. there's a lot of leverage out there. Someone's getting their face torn off right now. And there's certainly indications that the banks that have been short for so long are running for the hills now. The land of Arcadia. Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics on Monday, July 27th. Certainly an exciting couple of, uh, not even a full 24 hours yet since the open in the silver market. Although I suppose by the time you're watching this, it will have been. Although uh, I'm sure you've been checking your charts and wow, it's amazing. Uh, silver just continues to climb. Uh, was up a little bit on the open last night. And then you saw this jump. Uh, we talked about that on the show last week where um, one way or another, you figured once you hit that 23 mark and we're straddling that for a little while, that uh, you'd have a big move in one direction. Sure enough, this time it jumped almost a dollar at a pop. <clears throat> Again, it's interesting. You see there was a little dive there then. And then even today, just following through, uh, this is something I really haven't seen since 2011. Um, and today's video, the main portion is going to be an interview I did with Trevor Hall on his Mining Stock Journal, where we dug into a lot of these things uh, and some interesting questions. Although one note before I roll that, I've heard a lot of people saying, especially in the past week, of whether silver has gone up too fast or has to correct. Or, um, and I'm first, I mean, I guess I was thinking about that, where it's like, first of all, we're talking about something where, in terms of big silver moves, a sample size of two. I mean, there's 1980 and 2011, so it's not like we're talking about the roulette wheel. We've got the math backed out that over time or, um, so I would suggest, A, that I don't think anybody knows. We're all making educated guesses. I mean, I think you can make some high probability educated guesses about the medium or long term, but what path silver will take, um, I'd say just take that with a grain of salt. Um, although for what it's worth, I was thinking about it where I wondered, because I think now, I'm going to be clear with my phrasing. I'm not saying anything is going to happen, but just simply, if you looked at, for example, in 1979, 1980, I pulled up the price. I was wondering how quickly it moved back then. Um, so here you see $6 in the beginning of 1980, <clears throat> actually 1979, then starts climbing as you got into the fall here uh, pretty consistently, but you see that $24 was reached on December 24th. And all right, let's take a little poll here. Everyone who's playing along uh, in the chat room, how long do you think it took from when silver hit $24 to when it then hit 50? <clears throat> and uh, place your bets and the wheel is clear. Silver Roulette um, live here on Arcadia Economics. You can see from December 24th to January 18th. So it was... Uh, under a month, uh, I guess that would be uh, maybe three-ish, three-ish plus weeks. Um, so, which again, to be clear, is not to say that because it happened like that in 1980, that it's going to happen like that. But I would just, it's just interesting to me that A, not a, people are pointing to these two data points, which A, isn't a big sample size, and B, in one of them, at least if it did play out according to that schedule, that would mean we'd have $50 silver by the time Silverfest hits at September 12th through 13th, um, where I will be filming live from a silver vault. I don't know if the silver figurines are going to be ready by then, but um, feel free to pressure Andy Schechtman. Uh, here's his cell phone number. Call him. Uh, no, don't do that. Um, I'll stay on them and make sure they're coming. Um, although one other note... <clears throat> In case you're wondering how quickly things went up in 2011, well, I got you covered. That's right. That's how we treat our guests here in Silverland. Uh, you see, end of October 2396 closed, and wow, looks like it jumped a dollar 95 cents on the first day of November. And then looks, it was a little bit slower in 2000. 
11 because here you see it was then uh, end of April, May 1st, which we've talked about plenty on here. So, um, and even on that schedule, we'd put it at the end of the year. Um, again, does that mean $50 silver is coming? Uh, I think eventually, uh, and maybe the point of all this is just to point out I think it's possible that something could happen quite quickly. I mean, you look at what's happening with gold and everything else in the world where even gold sitting a new record and today's headline is about Steve Mnuchin getting ready to spend a trillion dollars. So with that said, uh, real quick, tonight's episode was sponsored by Visla Resources. We had Michael Connert of Visla back on the show a couple of weeks ago. They've had some great Joe results and also quite some action in their stock price up quite a bit. Um, it's a project you're going to be hearing about plenty in the coming years. So stay tuned. And at the end of tonight's episode, there will be a link directly there. So you can get more information, start learning about them. And with that said, thanks as always for being here. I'm so glad so many of you have joined along for these exciting events. I think you're going to love tonight's interview. And here you go. Happy Monday out there, everybody. Welcome back into Mining Stock Daily. This will be our last market commentary of the day. Happy to be joined by my good friend and one of the most prolific silver bulls I've ever known in my entire life. <laughs> you maybe know him from Arcadia Economics on his YouTube channel. Oh, come channel. on, there's got to be someone more of a silver bug than me. I've set, I've set the record in your book. Chris Marcus. Chris Marcus, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Mining Stock Daily, my friend. Hi, Trevor. How are you? I'm doing okay. Uh, Am I really the biggest it, silver bug you've ever met? Uh, yeah, in my uh, direct Rolodex, my go-to, yeah, I think so. I Kranzler, Kranzler is definitely up there too, but I think uh, you're a little bit uh, more outspoken I got on him. Beat on. Yeah. He, still, he still has gold in his email signature, so... <laughs> you're the, uh, the blue-collar precious metal guy. How about that? You're the silver guru. I mean, I'm grateful to be able to talk about silver and follow some of the fascinating things that are going on and uh, happy to be here today and certainly a lot of action so we can dig in. All right. So you, you have recently published a book called The Big Silver Short. It's accessible via your website at Arcadia Economics. Uh, I have not read it yet. However, let's talk about silver. Although we, move. Can, we can get you the audio copy too, Trevor, because I know you're not getting out <laughs> too much right now. So that part is digital. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but uh, let's talk about the silver short. Where are we at here? I mean, big moves on silver, but it's still got a lot of catching up to do if you're looking and comparing it to the gold, gold moves. Yeah, well, it is pretty interesting and... <sighs> You have a lot of fascinating dynamics playing out, um, least of which is gold now at a new all-time record high, finally crossed $1,900, wild Sunday night of trading. Um, silver, what's it up? I see a buck 64 gold as above its all-time high, which is interesting to think about because in 1980, gold reached $850 and silver reached $50. Then in 2011, gold reaches $1,900, silver reaches 50 again. And now we're over double the 1980 high. We're past the 2011 high. Um, I went over to CNBC this morning to see, I wonder if they're talking about gold yet. Although the headline there was about how Steve Mnuchin is getting ready to do another $1 trillion stimulus. And I also saw that the Federal Reserve is concerned about the outlook. Um, so, gee, I mean, if this is happening to gold right now, and then you have that, it's, I mean, because it's not like, it's not like Corona's done and the Fed's gonna start tightening now. I mean, that couldn't be, <laughs> <laughs> that couldn't be further from, from happening. Jerome Powell, even a couple of months ago, came out and said, we're not going to raise interest rates till 2022, which basically means they're never going to raise interest rates. Uh, it sure seems like sometime this year they're going to up the ante on unlimited quantitative easing, which is like, all right, infinity. <laughs> 
is not enough. <laughs> we'll go bigger. And at, but perhaps the real kicker is that you could say, all right, Chris, I've heard you talking about this for years, you know, blah, 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 silver's manipulated. Well, we've also talked about how, <laughs> we've also talked about how at the same time, this probably goes on until people start showing up and saying, I want physical metal rather than paper, because that's really, you've, you've had for the last let, nine years, you know, probably even farther back than that, but that's been hap hasn't that been happening? Hasn't then there been a real increase in demand for the physical silver metal? You have massive increase in demand for silver, gold on a retail level. I mean, you've all heard about, you know, the, the bullion shops that were basically getting blown out of, of their supply back after the prices dip. That settled down a little bit, although Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin, uh, had him on my show last week. He was mentioning how wholesale premiums for him, for the dealers have risen in silver. But the real kicker is that you're finally seeing this on the wholesale level as well, where record demand on the COMEX, um, the SLV numbers are so stunning. In fact, I have a growing list of people who say that it's just not possible. They have to be fabricating those numbers. Even if the silver was there, like the amount of, People required to, you know, log all these bars that are allegedly going in. Um, so I don't know which would be more bullish for silver if the numbers are accurate or if for some reason they're fat. I don't know why you'd fabricate numbers showing record demand. But I mean, these numbers of the, the SLV and the Silver Trust, I mean, last week, I think 40 million ounces <laughs> went in. That's that's like 5% of the annual production in a normal year. So basically in one week, at that pace over 20 weeks, you'd be taking just in 20 weeks, which is five months, the Silver Trust would eat the annual production at that pace. So there'd be no silver for industry or any of these things. And this is in a year where we've had the mines shut down for a couple of months. I mean, you're seeing a, we're seeing a run on the physical metal. I don't even think we saw this in 2011. And I was thinking about this morning where you, I mean, you saw Warren Buffett acquire, uh, or not Warren Buffett. Well, you actually did see him too. Warren Buffett twice had, uh, I believe, larger positions than the Hunt brothers. But even in 1980, when the Hunt brothers yeah, they had about 100 million ounces, less than JP Morgan shows on their current COMEX inventory warehouse. And, you know, what got them into trouble, they did a lot of this on leverage. I don't think, not really since the London gold pool, have we seen a run on the physical metal like this, which has always been the Achilles to this scheme. So to see that happening and now to see these jumps in the price where, it took four years to get the price back above $20. And now we're seeing one or $2 gaps up, which there are some people who had forecast that. And I thought when you put 500 plus one leverage on anything, you kind of guarantee that sort of outcome. And we certainly got another example of it last night. So for everybody out there who hasn't caught on, Chris Marcus and I have a little deal. Whenever Chris mentions silver manipulation, he has to take a shot of tequila. Uh, it's not noon yet, Chris, so I'm just going to put a tally on my board here. So you have okay. one. Okay. Yeah, in case anybody wondered why I spontaneously giggled in the middle of my sentence before. It, and it, for people who know Chris and knowing that him and I have this little ongoing thing about this, you can realize he is not necessarily a cheap date anymore. Wow. <laughs> Well, I'll behave myself. I had a shot a couple of weeks ago, and I think I'm still feeling it. So, my, uh... <laughs> so, the, so I, I wonder how much are you paying attention to the gold silver ratio? I know a lot of people watch it religiously. Other people don't think anything of it. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of movement. It has decreased over the last week or two. Uh, it was really pushing up there above 100 level for many weeks prior to silver finally breaking out. So just curious, like how much of this are you really paying attention to when it comes to that ratio? I'm aware of it, but I don't know. I mean, it's like 
you know, for years people are talking about how at 80 to one, it was really high. And I agree, especially when, uh, you know, fast forward to this year now, it's not one to one. It's not like for every $10,000 of gold people buy, they buy 10,000 of silver. Uh, I asked Rick Rule about that. And he said, it's definitely more gold. Although I've heard some retail dealers once say as much as three to one in favor of silver. So, you know, we could debate. I don't, I don't have the exact numbers on that, but it's not anywhere close to 80 to one. Yet we saw that. And it's interesting. Uh, I won't. When the silver market is distorted by paper trading, <laughs> ever late wants to label that. You see that? I'm, I got, I'm sharp today. I saw what you did there. You get a silver rally, and I'm at the top of my game, Trevor. So whatever you want to call it, when that happens or when silver goes from 21 to 9 in the face of investment banks failing in 2008, um, at the lows in March, at what the ratio, I think it got up to 125 or 129 to 1. So it's one of those things that, yeah, it's high. Um, it can go higher. Markets trade the way they do. And certainly if there's any market that you've seen can be pushed around and isn't going to follow your day-to-day -day news on a precise free, I mean, if there's ever been an example of something that doesn't hit the free market hypothesis, that all information is transmitted to every investor at the same time, silver is it. So, you know, all right, and I'll even say, if people don't like saying manipulation, do whatever you want, Trevor. Um, but, it, you know, there's a reason that the prices go in the way they do. We've seen the influence of the paper trading. And, I mean, I think it's safe to say it's a, uh, several felony violations of the law, yet nonetheless, um, you know, I found helpful on the trading floor. There's what I think is fair and there's what's going to happen. Now, at the same time, I know some people wish the price were going to go up a lot more than it already has. But the fact that if the market is distorted to the downside, then that is what's creating the opportunity to buy something cheap. And I find the more I shift my mindset towards, all right, well, I you know, if I still have income coming in, I can and buy more and I, then great, you know, and comes down to if you really feel something is out of line to me, it, that's why I wrote the book because it was almost trying to disprove my own original thesis of, it seemed to me natural demand for metal because of QE2, because the US was getting downgraded, because there was never an attempt to rein in the spending that was driving silver to $50. And if the only reason it traded lower because banks sold paper, gold and silver that they don't have and doesn't exist. In fact, Trevor, did you know that at least according to the CFTC's government report, it shows the four largest traders in silver are short about 248 million ounces, which means that between 20 and 24, those four banks lost a billion dollars. Didn't so there's a lot of leverage out there. Someone's getting their face torn off right now. And there's, uh, we can dig into it more if you'd like, but there's certainly indications that the banks that have been short for so long are running for the hills now. Do you think they've lost control of this thing? Are we there yet? Um, it sure is starting to seem like it. Uh, with that said, you know, it's like, uh, you, you remember Field of Dreams where uh, they tell the young guy, they're like, you know, look for the curveball low and away, but watch out for the fastball up and in the ear. So if there's ever been a market where leverage is not the best, or margin is not the best idea, silver is it. I mean, geez, if you really want to have a shot at an amplified return, um, now my background is as an option trader, so that's what I like, but just the idea of like, be prepared that the thing could go, it's up two bucks today. It could go down $2 tomorrow. I don't think it's impossible to go back into the teens. I don't know that I think that's likely. Uh, and certainly if this demand continues for physical metal, 
I also think there's a degree to which the secret's getting out of the bag now. Trevor, I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, you know, normally the money goes first to gold, then the gold stocks and silver, and then silver stocks are the last. But I mean, it sure feels like there's been a lot of money, institutional money now, piling into silver stocks even. And I would say that, again, this is just me wondering, but it's like if the banks had the ability to contain this market, and especially given, uh, you know, how there was the, got up to 20 bucks in 2016 and all the people who trade based off of patterns, you would have thought that they would throw the kitchen sink at the price to keep it below 20 bucks. And uh, I might add, there's a guy named Bill Murphy who has been saying for years, once silver gets through 2021, 20, watch out. And uh, he certainly turned out to be quite correct. And um, so, I mean, is it over? I can't say the market is trading fairly because it's still trading 25 bucks, which to me still seems in terms of what would be the price. Put it, put it another way, if the COMEX open interest in that short position were settled out, I don't think the price would be anywhere near $25 without derivative leverage. So, well, and, and I'm wondering, and I'm wondering if um, you kind of list the chronological order of where this money flows through the sector. So I do want to ask you about the silver stocks, Chris, in just a minute. But, you know, I think one of the thoughts about how the paper market of precious metal works, if, if that hasn't been able to catch the attention and concern of people because it's just a real difficult way to understand how those positions based on derivatives are actually flow through the system. And it's one of those things, well, if I can't understand it in 10 seconds, then it's not worth my time. Um, so that's why people like you are continually spreading the message of what's been happening. And so kudos to you. Uh, and honestly, I'm not very good at it either. I, I, you know, depend on people like you and listen to get a better understanding of where they're at. But so I'm wondering if that's the case, but where we are right now, from what I'm seeing, just in observations, I'm seeing a lot more speculation from younger, I guess you could call them Robin Hood traders, uh, for lack of a better, for lack of a better description, wanting to go into the paper market and push this thing higher, much like they did a lot of the, they've done with a lot of the tech stocks in the last couple of months. All right, is this a fair assessment? Are you seeing something similar? I mean, it's funny. I'm actually going to pull up Robinhood, the trading site. I've heard so much about it. I've never actually seen it. I'm still uh, not entirely sure. Although I guess to the degree, is there a new audience uh, or millennials coming into gold and silver? Um, I don't know if it's millennials driving the market. I think they're a segment of the whole world on some level. You're getting a lot of new money. This is not just the gold and silver bucks. It's a different market. And that's not what we've seen before. I mean, to me, this is on a different level than 2011. Um, so, I mean, but the thing is, it's like when you know, when gold's already at an all time high and the Fed's gonna probably ease more and Steve Newton's talking about a st another trillion dollars of stimulus, you know, at some point people aren't complete morons, you know? And it's like, I, I think it, you, they conned people over the last decade. Oh, well, we're gonna undo the stimulus. And then here, you had Jeremy Powell go on and say, well, now's not the time to undo any of this. We need the stimulus now. I mean, there's going to be a time to repay it. But what about for the last, I mean, Trump's been there for four years talking about what a great economy it was, how strong and prosper it is. How come then wasn't the time to repay any of this debt? How come that wasn't the time to raise interest rates? But you saw what happened at the end of 2018. What they get to the Fed funds rate up to like their window was two and a quarter to two and a half. And the thing was melting down. And I'm sure everyone who's been, you know, listening now, you guys remember, you've been, you've been trading since then. And um, so, I mean, I think it's growing. Uh, 
you know, and certainly that was one of the things with the book to put this in context of why it's past the point of no return. This isn't anything that any central bank does is going to be some form of printing money that they don't have. So you can call it quantitative easing, long-term LTOs, tiddlywinks, Santa's cookies, whatever. There, th that's all that they can do. It, it's like the bank has already been robbed. The money is flown out the window or been burned or spent or whatever. And, um, but I think the best news touching on something you just said earlier. Yeah. To me, it's, it's darn fat. It's the most fascinating thing I've ever, ever imagined to see in my financial career. I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, you don't, I don't know that you plan for this. So, yeah, it's fun and to, to cover this and follow the developments. But I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, silver might go up or down today or tomorrow. I'd be flipping coins guessing. But for folks that if you're able to take a long term perspective, you can take the timing out of it. I mean, basically, the only downside to silver is, you know, maybe they raise margins or something or, you know, uh, you know, maybe they but nothing that changes unless you see the fed raising rates and the system somehow staying intact, if you can explain that someone, please email me through my site. Cause I can't figure it out. Or if you see Nancy Pelosi, all right, Trevor, give me, I'll tell you the downside to silver. <laughs> what are the percent chances you see Nancy Pelosi, Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell, and you know, toss it, Tim Geithner, whoever else you want, by the way, we're making silver figurines out of your favorite central bankers, which is, <laughs> the, there's already a shortage of those. We haven't even started production, but I mean, maybe if you see them getting together to a picnic, hugging it out, having a big meditation session and saying, wow, oh my God, Donald, you know, we're, US is really in debt. We, we might want to address that. It, it seems, and then there's, we promised on top of the 25 trillion Although actually, Trevor, I'd probably have to check that. It's probably a few more than 25 now yeah. or the 200 plus trillion of unfunded liabilities. So if you see those guys getting together, resolving the debt, I don't think it's even possible, even if there was political will. And that's, this was bound to happen eventually. And certainly it seems like gold, gold is at, at its new record high. I know it's, it's wild because so much I mean, you have gold and silver moving, stock market getting whacked for quarantine, and it's all happened so quickly that I don't think it can truly sink in. But gold is, that's a historic event that just occurred. It is. It is. And I'm glad you said something because we got to wrap this up, Chris, but I can't tell you how many times my mouth got me in trouble prior to COVID when I said, if the economy is doing so well, why is money so damn cheap? The whole thing was always predicated, and that's the thing. Of course, it seems great when you're lowering interest rates, and Bernanke has his op-ed back in October of 2010 where he sold, con sold by conning the people on QE2, and he talked about this virtuous circle that was going to develop of prosperity and teddy bears by lowering interest rates and buying all the debt but he didn't mention, wouldn't you expect the, the exact opposite effect when you raise interest rates? Mm -hmm. Is it a coincidence that if, and here's a challenge, uh, look at any stock chart and look at whatever was the dominant interest rate affecting that stock market throughout history, and you'll see the same pattern. It's like if, if you can afford 4% interest, I come along and say, oh, well, I'm going to lower it to 2%. And you, you get that on a, you know, short-term adjustable rate it seems great till interest goes up to five percent. That's why the stock, the dot-com bubble collapsed the way it did. That's why the housing bubble collapsed the way it did. Now I miss those two, but you know, I started reading guys like our friend Dave Kranzler, Peter Schiff, all the other people that laid out to the letter why the housing bubble would collapse the exact way it did. We never know the when. That's the part that. You know, it's like life has, nature has its own timing, but rather than needing to know that, you can see these trends. Don't take my word for anything I'm saying here. I mean, anything, it's not, 
and I'm not making it up, but I mean, you can look it up. I'm just, mm -hmm. but we're trained to look away from some of these things. And, but certainly for people who saw the big short and thought, yeah, well that, I guess in hindsight, it was kind of obvious. Uh, I wonder if there's ever, man, that'd be, it'd be, wouldn't it be great if there was something like that happened again? Well, it's happening now. Look and, no further. <laughs> you know, and I think it's an exciting time. So. <laughs> All right, Chris. Even though it's an exciting time, it is also a volatile and scary time for many. So let's, uh, you know, keep that into perspective as well. Right. I think that's important. Yeah, actually, and if I may touch on that for a moment, um, I certainly uh, think a lot about that, where it's like, uh, you know, I know a lot of people, they're having their lives change drastically now. Um, I think that's kind of what nature and economies do in their own way. In fact, that was when I was sitting back on a trading floor back in 2011, studying all this, and it, it reached a point where it's was like, gee, these this job isn't going to exist soon. Um, so maybe I got a little bit of a head start on it, but Trevor, if someone's even listening to this right now, you see, even despite the move in gold and silver, I wonder how many people that, you know, in the average population have any idea that anything's happening with gold and silver. So, and certainly in my journey over these last eight years, learning to start a business after doing corporate for my entire life, has been quite an adventure in times where I was petrified and scared and wondering, you know, whether I'd pay my rent or how things were going to work out. So by all means, I understand that. And I appreciate that. And would just say the best part is, is that the things that, you know, if you're listening to Trevor's podcast, the things that you're getting here are valuable. And what I did was say, all right, how can I take, and I think that's what, in the corporate system, we've been trained not to do, but the more it's like, all right, if you find this stuff fascinating, you know, I mean, geez, it's gonna, how exciting that the gold and silver industry is finally gonna be growing rather than the maybe military or the corporate bond market and just having an understanding, uh, there's be a lot of companies, a lot of demand, and uh, I would just encourage people to keep learning. And, you know, if it's something that really motivates you, uh, I think there'll be opportunity there or whatever people are doing in life. Um, so I, I get what you're saying and I know, but I think there's a great, as we can adjust to that, I think th there's always great opportunity when we're in the right mindset to see it. Uh, I do honestly believe that I've seen it in my own life. And if there's anything I could encourage people to do, would just feel empowered that you're going to, you're, you're on the right track and you're going to figure these things out. And hopefully, uh, you know, some investing knowledge can be a helpful part along the way. And we're here for you, both of you, both you and I. Yeah. We're here for you guys and gals. I mean, Trevor, you know, in all honesty, I, you know, I have the channel and I talk about silver and, you know, and silver's going to go up, blah, blah, blah. But I've realized it's interesting as time goes on. Yes. I think there's value in that. But more so what I think has gone really well is, is helping people to see that I don't, I don't, I, I, and I used to believe that, you know, well, the dollar is going to collapse. We're all going to be screwed. And it's going to be, I don't think that's for everyone who's concerned about that. Consider that we just went through the greatest, whatever. I mean, we had the big <laughs> virus come through town and yet despite all of that, even with a, a virus, whatever one may think of the numbers or reporting um, still food was in the supermarket. You know, I mean, we had some rioting on a very, uh, another incident, but I mean, still, I think we, we, we keep living. I think we're trained more than we know to do some of these things. And anyway, uh, that's, that's, we do keep, we I do approach. keep living Chris and uh, knowing you, Knowing you pretty well, and you knowing me, I think it's safe to say between this conversation is what I, we've lost a little love, you know, a little love this year, a little understanding. It's been a it's been a tough year. I don't think we've I don't think we've been very uh, kind to one another on many different levels. Well, 
I don't know how you measure that. Um, I see, I focus on what I can- Rainbows and unicorns. There's ways in which, there's some beautiful ways in which we've all as a society come together through a pretty unique and interesting challenge. Um, so, I mean, again, I think it's a matter of what we focus on and- uh, yeah, That's true. You know, when you have conversation with friends and one of the first things that says like, well, the world's on fire. <laughs> There were people who it's made tough. a fortune during the Great Depression, and I don't say that it was at the expense of someone else, but I mean, right here, again, not. I mean, we've identified a shift that unless the government's going to repay money, that seems mathematically impossible on a variety of levels. All right, you know, dollar's going to do this, gold's going to do that. I mean, whatever it is, rather, I, I think the, the key shift is once we start saying whether it's investments, career, your business. All right. May, hey, maybe this is or isn't how I think it should be, but it seems like this is the way we're going. How can I begin going with that and allowing, because we all have the ability to do that. Um, and I'm not saying this, telling anyone else what to do, but just in my own career in life, I've seen that when I take my own accountability, if something's not going the way I like, all right, what's the adjustment so I can you know, see this differently or get a different outcome. And it's there now. And again, uh, keep listening to Trevor and you're going to find a lot of companies that are going to be doing really well. And, um, and I think that part's exciting and that there will be a lot of good on the other side of this. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate your time, man. Thank you, my friend. It's Chris Marcus, Arcadia Economics. Go check out his website, arcadiaeconomics.com. Pick up one of his books, The Big Silver Short. We'll have you on again soon, my friend. Take it easy. Thanks, Trevor. So there is tonight's show. Thank you, as always, for watching. I can't even imagine what the silver price is going to be by the time you're actually seeing this. But to stay posted for all sorts of great updates, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell, and I will see you again tomorrow.